let's talk about cesarean. The purpose of cesarean birth is to preserve the health of the mother and fetus. That's page 955. Your book states that the rate of cesarean birth is 20.6%. In many geographical areas and with certain physicians, the rates vary. Some rates may be as high as 45%. Older women have a higher risk of cesarean, probably due to other health factors and multiple gestation. Women with private insurance and higher socioeconomic levels also have increased rates of operative births. Some of this is due to physician preference and some to mother's preference. My college roommate and I ran into one another a few years ago. She told me she had both of her children by elective cesarean. She had always heard such horror stories about vaginal birth from her mother and was just frightened to go that route. I think she traded a natural process with a quick recovery for major abdominal surgery with a minimum six weeks recovery. Page 956 makes the point that the way to reduce a woman's chances of a cesarean is for her to have early and continuous support throughout labor from a woman, especially if it is not a hospital staff member that has other responsibilities. Emergency, unplanned cesarean, can be very traumatic for families. Since they were not planning on delivering that way and something bad has happened to put the mother or fetus at risk, they are quite stressed and worried. They need support and information. Labor and delivery nurses also double as surgical nurses in the OR for cesareans. Nearly all hospitals cross-train their nurses to be able to assist with either type of delivery. Depending on the reason for the woman's cesarean, she may be able to have su subsequent babies by VBAC, which stands for vaginal birth after cesarean, and a trial of labor is attempted to see how well it will be tolerated. Let's talk about post-term or post-dates pregnancy. If a delivery has not occurred by the end of the 42nd week, it is called a post-term pregnancy. If the placenta is unable to deliver plenty of nutrients or can deliver too many nutrients, the fetus may become macrosomic. If the placenta ages and functionally declines, the fetus could lose weight. Neither scenario is good. Some clinicians wait until 43 weeks to induce and some induce all of their patients once they reach 41 to 42 weeks. Here is where we have where having a reliable estimated date of delivery is really important. We don't want to induce a woman at 40 weeks because we think she's 43 weeks. Amniotic fluid volume decreases after 37 weeks steadily. This makes cord compression a greater risk. Amnio infusion may need to be used, especially if meconium is present or in cases of severe oligohydramnios. Shoulder dystocia. The one doing the delivery should manage this, but the nurse will need to help. There are a number of different position changes that assist with this, and suprapubic pressure is often used. This is essentially just pushing on the fetal shoulder, making the fetus collapse his shoulders inward so that he can make it through the birth canal. Prolapse cord is a surgical emergency. The nurse may put the mother in a head lower than the uterus position, use a gloved hand to try to keep the fetal head from compressing the cord against the pelvis. Uterine rupture is another surgical emergency. Sometimes it is accompanied by no sensation and sometimes by a severe, sharp, tearing pain. A major rupture will mean possibly loss of mom and baby, maybe just hysterectomy and blood replacement for mom, very likely hypoxia for the baby. Amniotic fluid embolism is an extremely serious situation. The mortality rate is as high as 80%. We don't know how to prevent it. It is always unexpected. Note the signs and symptoms. First, acute dyspnea, severe hypotension, often followed by respiratory arrest. The patient will need 100% oxygen, intubation, and will be moved to the ICU.